David dwelt in a nice house of cedar, so he thought it was only fitting that God should have a permanent house also. He desired to build him one, and when he first told the idea to Nathan, as you just heard, uh, Nathan agreed that it seemed like a good idea, but God said no. We want to look at 1 Chronicles 22, which is a parallel passage, but it includes a few more details than what are included in this uh, account. So in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, we want to look at verses 7 and 8. 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 and 8. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth and in my sight. However, even though David was refused, God did not want him to be totally disappointed. Therefore, he promised that David's son would build him that house that David had in mind. And we read that picking up where we left off in 1 Chronicles 22, verses 9 through 11. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon, for I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the house, or the throne rather, of his kingdom in Israel forever. Now, my son, may the Lord be with you, and may you prosper and build the house of the Lord your God, which uh, he has uh, said to you. That was one way of alleviating the disappointment that uh, David probably felt in being denied the building of a house for God. But God also made another promise to David. Basically, it is this, you wanted to build a house for me, but I'm going to build one for you. Let's take a look going back to 2 Samuel 7 and uh, notice verses 11 through 13. Since the time I commanded judges to be over my people, Israel, and have caused you to rest from your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, Solomon would build the literal temple in the Old Testament, the one to the Lord, a physical building, but Jesus would build a spiritual kingdom house that would last forever. So in this passage, we see that the words kingdom, house, and temple are equivalents. They all refer to the same thing. I don't think the word temple is used, but that's what uh, Solomon built when he built God's house. It was called the temple. Now, let's leave that uh, scene for a, a while and go 500 years later to the time of Daniel, 
who interpreted the king of Babylon's dream. Uh, we want to go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Um, we're not going to read the entire account of what happened and so forth, but just this interpretation of it. Daniel explains that there are four world kingdoms, the first of which is Babylon, followed by Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome, and, and uh, of course uh, uh, that was uh, division after the time of the Roman kings, but four world kingdoms. In verse 44, and in the days of these kings, that is the fourth kingdom, the, the Roman kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So in the days of the Roman king, a kingdom would be established. God would establish it, and it would last forever. And so that is a, another prophecy of the kingdom, the house, the temple of God. Now this kingdom was preached by John the baptizer as he came, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 2. And then Jesus came with a same message in Matthew 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this kingdom that had been prophesied to David in 2 Samuel 7, and which was explained to King Nebuchadnezzar by Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, this kingdom is now being presented as about to appear. It's at hand. So the kingdom they had been waiting on, the Jews, uh, had, the descendants of David, uh, the Israelites, they had all been waiting for this time for this kingdom. And now it is at hand. But notice the spiritual emphasis this kingdom promised to David and pinpointed to be established in the days of the Roman kings has a spiritual emphasis, the kingdom of heaven. Mark and Luke call it more often the kingdom of God. But in either case, there is a spiritual emphasis. And this kingdom is the church. We find in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus saying, Upon this rock, I will build my church. And then he refers to it as the kingdom in the very next verse. Let's take a look. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 18. And I also say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock, and we'll take a look at that rock in just a moment, uh, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The church. I will build my church and give you the keys of the kingdom. The church and the kingdom are used synonymously in this passage. Well, notice again 2 Samuel 13, 7.13. He will build a house. Jesus said, I will build my church. The same word uh, used in the Greek Septuagint, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into the Greek in a translation called the Septuagint, sometimes noted by LXX, 70, 
referring to the amount of translators who translated it, the same word used for uh, he will build a house is the same word used by Jesus when he says, I will build my church. And uh, I mentioned that we would take a look at the rock. Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. They were uh, in this location where this huge rock exists. In fact, the whole thing is, is rock. And uh, it was in front of this that Jesus made this pronouncement. But let's continue with the idea of the equivalence. The church, the body, the kingdom, the house, the temple are all equivalents. In John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered from the Jews or to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Matthew 16, 18 and 19, we already noticed the interchange of church and kingdom. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. <clears throat> Paul writes to the young evangelist these words. But if I uh, am delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. The house of God, what's that? Which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth. The house of God is a spiritual house in the New Testament. It is not like the temple that Solomon built. It is not that house. It is a spiritual house. It is the church of the living God. And so we see those are used interchangeably. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 we find Paul writing, and he put all things under his feet, meaning Jesus, and gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And so we have the body in the church identified as the same thing. Next, let's go to Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God uh, in the Spirit. So the building and the temple, these also are equivalents. Then we have 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 where we find uh, more information on this particular subject. We read in 1 Peter 2, 5, You also, as living stones, now he's talking to the church, you also, as living stones, not, not like the stones that uh, Solomon brought in to build the temple, but you, you Christians, are living stones uh, being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we have a spiritual house, a temple. And then uh, the last thing we want to look at in this regard is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, 
we choose uh, that particular verse to let it be known that Paul, again, is writing to Christians. Notice the address that he gives in the letter. To the church of God, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus uh, Christ, both theirs and ours. Okay, so this letter is addressed to Christians. What does he say concerning them? Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you, Christians, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So what do we find in these passages? We find that the kingdom, the house, the temple, the church, the body of Christ are all identified as the same entity which God promised David when he said, I will build you a house. And this would occur, this would be established in the time of the Roman kings. That is, at the time of the New Testament, the Roman kings were in power when Jesus said, I will build my house church. Now those who are baptized for the forgiveness of sins are citizens of this kingdom. Now, what does all of this mean to us? You might say, well, that's all very interesting, but what does that mean to us? There is a common misunderstanding in society today concerning the nature of the church. Many think the church is a social institution that they can take or leave, visit when they feel like it, and be involved or not be involved with it. Is that so? Is that so with a kingdom? Don't all citizens have a function? Don't they pay taxes? seek employment, and contribute to the good of the community, of society? Aren't all bricks in a temple important? Don't the windows and roofs have functions that are necessary? What about a body? Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 21. Now remember, as we read this, we're talking about the temple, the house, the kingdom, the church, the body. 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. And so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized, into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in effect, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I am not part of the body, is it therefore not part of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? And now God has set members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, 
nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So, where does the idea come from that the church, the body of Christ, is something that is optional, peripheral, or casual? Well, apparently that comes from society, from the way a lot of people think. Maybe to go beyond that from the devil, but it doesn't come from the word of God. This is not what we read of the body, the kingdom, the church, the house, the temple. That's not how it's described. The thought that is wrong that says if I occasionally attend worship, I have fulfilled my obligation to God. But the rest of my time is my own. Is that how a kingdom works? A house? A body? You know, how would you like it if your liver said, I worked for an hour last Sunday, I'm taking the rest of the week off. I don't think we'd like the result of that, would we? We expect all the parts of our bodies to work, but why do we not expect all parts of the church to work? Why casual? Why peripheral? Why optional? That's not biblical. We all have different talents and abilities for a reason. This was evident in the first century when God gave miraculous gifts to church members. There are uh, a number of them listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the early chapters, but, or the early verses, but let's go to the end of the chapter, beginning with verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. They had different gifts for different purposes. And, but all were important. Every part of the body of Christ is important. And they are all to exercise the gifts that they have. Those gifts were to be used to build up the body of Christ and to bring others to that body. The church has these things as divine goals, and in fact there are some others. Let's just put it this way. Divine goals that God has given the church, worship. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two through 29 is a lengthy passage on the Lord's Supper, and uh, we refer to that often, but that's part of worship. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13 and uh, verse 15, just as another passage that deals with this subject. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer, continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And there are many other passages that deal with worship, talking about prayer and uh, giving and teaching and so forth. A second divine goal is to serve. Many passages deal with this. But uh, since we're in Hebrews 13, let's look at verse 16. But do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Uh, we are to, by love, 
serve one another, Galatians 5.13, and many other passages. And speaking of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men. So we are to worship, we are to serve, we are to restore Christians who are in error, you who are spiritual, Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. But those who are falling away or have fallen away need to be restored. That's a divine goal God has given us. And then, of course, there is evangelize. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And therefore, we should go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all things, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, Jesus said, whatever I have commanded you. In order to have people lead in worship, in order to serve one another and others who are even outside the body of Christ, in order to restore Brethren who are falling away, in order to evangelize, we have various talents, abilities, and gifts in order to do that. But all the church is to be involved in that. Not one or two people, not a committee, but this is for all Christians. Notice these are letters that are addressed to all Christians, not some sort of elite that gets to do it. But all of us have these talents and abilities that need to be used in the church, the house of God, the temple, the kingdom. Our culture is big on worship, but does not seem to be aware of these other obligations. We don't have spiritual miraculous gifts to fulfill God's will, but we do have natural talents and abilities that he has given us. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. This begins with another reference to miraculous gifts. But the rest of them, after verse 6, could be either miraculous or not miraculous. Having then gifts, Romans 12, 6, differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Again, prophesying is obviously miraculous and that may be involved in some of the others too. But it does not have to be. People minister and serve and teach and exhort and lead. Various members can do these things. We have people today who have teaching expertise, computer expertise, who are a handyman and being able to repair and fix things, who can pro uh, solve problems. All of these are needed in the church the body of Christ. And so the idea of being aloof and just attending an hour a week or something like that, this, this thought is foreign. We're dealing with a kingdom here, a temple that is a solid structure composed of uh, spiritual bricks, so to speak, and is built up. This is all something that God had planned over a thousand years ago, actually from the beginning of the world, but we noted particularly David about a thousand years before Christ and Daniel some 500 and some years before Christ. This is the kingdom of God that we're talking about. 
And so everyone has a responsibility to contribute to the whole, to contribute to the body of Christ in this place. Well, once again, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. For, um, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. There's only one way into this kingdom. And when John came preparing the way, he told people to be baptized. When Jesus followed him, he baptized also, though not personally, his disciples did. Baptism is part of the Great Commission, as we already noted from Matthew 28 and verses 18 through 20. But Paul is just simply mentioning here, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. The spirit wrote these words so that we would know how to get into that body and how to live and conduct ourselves once we are in that body. If you are in that body this morning, we rejoice in the decision that you made to become part of that body. And we encourage you not to be aloof or casual or peripheral, but part of the body in the way that God designed the body to work. But if you have not obeyed that gospel, you have the chance this morning or to talk with us further to find out that you need to repent of your sins. If you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he is, are you willing to repent of your sins? Confess that he is the Christ. Be buried with him in baptism so that his blood can wash away all your sins. If you haven't done that, you might want to give more serious thought to it. And we stand ready to help you. But in whatever way we can spiritually this morning, please let us know how we can help as we stand and sing. <laughs>